Today we're going to look at theories of development and we're going to look at the functionist theory of modernization theory. The big question with uh, modernization theory is, sort of like is, is how does it help development? And the type of exam question you're more likely to get is evaluate the contribution of modernization theories to our understanding of development. So in order to answer that type of question, what you need to do is be able to, de to define what is meant by development. You also need to be able to explain the difference between the first world and the second world countries. This really is a little bit of historical context, and uh, particularly um, in line with things like the Cold War. It is important to identify the stages of modernization theory, but you only really need to give a brief description of them. It's more important the process of modernization than the individual stages. We also need to be able to outline the reasons why modernization fails. And this is where we go back to um, one of our sociologists we've covered quite a bit, Tolkott Parsons. We need to analyze the impact of the ideas of modernization theory, um, particularly applying that to different sectors such as education, gender, health, uh, conflict. And we be able to need to, to give some evaluations of these views. Now, there are a lot of evaluations of modernization theorists. Many of them come from uh, dependency theorists who we're going to look at next. So we go back. Um, when we look at what a development is, it is essentially good change. And modernization theorists see development as being a positive change for different nations. The problem is with modernization theory is why? Why do they look to change and the developing world. Well, to answer that question, really what we've got to do is we've actually got to look back into history a little bit. Modernization theory comes about in the post-World War II era. At the end of the World War II, um, the world was pretty much split into three. We had the first world nations, which was essentially the Allies, the US, and um, Britain, most of Western Europe, and we had the second world countries, those that sort of like, those that um, favored communism. So most of Eastern Europe, parts of um, East Asia. Now, these became a concern to the Western leaders, the second world nations, because communism was becoming quite popular. And lots of third world nations, those that didn't either ally themselves with Western democracy or with Eastern communism, they looked to communism for solutions and it concerned Western nations. Why, you might say? Well, it gave Western nations less part partners to trade with. Because communism was essentially a self-sufficient ideology, it impeded US trade interests in the world. So the US were opposed to communism. Now, ideologically, they opposed communism because they said it was an authoritarian dictatorship. However, um, it limited the scope uh, for American companies to go overseas and trade. So the stronger the support for communist ideologies became, the weaker capitalism became. To understand modernization theory, you need to understand a little bit more about functionalism. Um, functionalism we've always seen as being quite a staid and quite a stable theory. But actually, theorists such as Durkheim proposed that societies will evolve. Uh, they would say that societies evolve because they have similar beliefs. Um, they will evolve into more complex societies where individuals start to have their own beliefs and society becomes less based on community and more based upon individualism. Ferdinand Tonnies, who is a big um, functionalist theorist that we, ha we haven't really looked at too much. If, you, if you'd done the religion module, we would have. He suggested that religion and community will eventually be replaced by scientific and superficial relations. So to a certain extent, Tonnies is actually right. Uh, it's from these ideas that modernization theory is developed. Uh, as society progresses through the evolutionary stages from the industrial revolution, uh, now we see sort of like part beyond globalization and we see sort of like into what we're on the verge of what we've seen as the fourth industrial revolution with the invention of artificial intelligence. This will bring changes to our society. 
And another functionalist, uh, another modernization theorist, Huntington, sort of like suggested that modernization is, is an evolutionary process that will bring about revolutionary changes. Now, these ideas might be completely new for people who haven't studied uh, functionalism in depth, but functionalism is a theory of evolution, even though we tend to suggest that they prefer traditional norms and values. So what is modernization theory? Well, it had two main aims. Um, it wanted to help poorer countries to develop, but it also explained why poorer countries fail to develop, both economically and culturally. The main idea behind Rostow's idea, now bear in mind Rostow worked for the US State Department at the height of the Cold War, was to provide a non-communist solution to poverty that suggested that economic change and the encouragement of certain cultural values will lead to development. I'll leave you to guess whose values um, that Rostow suggested that these developing nations should adopt, but Rostow essentially was uh, an agent of the US state. There was no neutrality. Um, his research and his work was very much value laden. And Rostow proposed a five stage model of modernization. Um, you can see on the diagram to the right um, the five stages that are there, and we will go through these individually slide by slide. The first stage was the traditional stage. This is what we would see as being subsistence agriculture, a very basic traditional society. Um, the second stage would be what we call the preconditions to take off, or some refer to it as the transitional stage. This is where we start to see surpluses from agriculture, and this becomes invested into technology, and therefore the surpluses can grow. The basic idea is if a farmer produces extra, maybe he could buy a tractor or he could buy machinery, which will help him to produce more the following year. Then it leads us to stage three, which is takeoff. Um, this is where the nation starts to resemble what we would see as being a, a more developed nation. Um, we start to see industrialization. We see investment both through aid and through um, the investment from transnational corporations. We will see regional growth. We'll start to see um, some political changes. We'll start to see the, the emergence of a democracy. And we will start to see um, diversification. We'll start to see some nations producing more uh, than just agricultural goods. This should lead them to the stage, stage four, which is a drive to maturity. And uh, this is where they start to innovate. They become less reliant upon imports. Um, they, there is heavier investment in the infrastructure of the nation, ultimately leading to stage five, which is high mass consumption. This is very much a consumer orientated um, society uh, where people purchase goods. Um, most people work in the service sector and it, that becomes dominant. And this is probably consistent with what you would imagine in the UK and the US now. So our first stage um, is the traditional society, um, very much based on subsistence agriculture, very little technology, um, very much a lack of a class system, economic mobility or economic mobility. This is still quite common in rural areas in the developing world. Uh, whereas the urban areas tend to have moved on to either stage two or stage three. Stage two, the preconditions for takeoff, or as we saw before, the transitional stage, this is where the demand for raw materials uh, increases. So it could be, for example, the demand for coffee in places like Kenya, um, which will lead to an economic change. More people will become involved and it will start to generate profit from the agricultural uh, products that they're producing. And what will happen is they'll be able to invest in further machinery. They'll be able to produce more and uh, enough to export. Um, if you go, for example, say uh, down most of your high streets now, you will see coffee from around the world. And this is a perfect example of, of what happens at stage two, is these nations start to produce more than they need. They start to sell it for export. And we in the West tend to consume it. We start to see then some individual social mobility. We start to see a little bit of a change towards the social structure, a movement away from collectivist ideals to more individualism, um, the introduction of entrepreneurship. And then we get to stage three. Those individuals who have moved up in, in uh, those individuals who have moved up the social ladder tend to take the lead and develop manufacturing industries. It usually is secondary goods, clothing, textiles, and goods like that. Goods that are mass produced and can be produced pretty much anywhere. But in 
um, the nations that are at stage three, they tend to be quite low wage economies. And as a consequence, lots of big companies, um, lots of TNCs will outsource the, their, their manufacturing to the developing world. Um, we only have to look in the labels in our clothes and see um, the, some of the nations that are at this stage, places like Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Bangladesh, um, Turkey. These are some of the areas um, where we would see um, that will be seen as being at stage three. Now, stage four is the drive to maturity. This is where you're more likely to see nations resembling what we would see in the developed world. So we're starting to see the development of infrastructures, not only for um, individuals to, to transport themselves around the country, but also for businesses to be able to move those goods. We see the development of bridges, roads, dams. We will see um, infrastructure developments like airports, seaports, um, rail links. They will become better as they move through the st stage to maturity. Now, often nations will go to places like the IMF or the World Bank to help get aid for these. So aid becomes very much a motor for change at stage, stage four and the drive to maturity. We can also see some of this happening um, through the investment from transnational corporations who want to be able to get their goods in and out of that country. Industry starts to diversify. We start to see a broader range. We see manufacturing shifting from capital uh, to consumer goods. So we start to see countries producing televisions. We start to see them producing iPods. We start to see them producing phones. And we start to see the development of transport and social infrastructures. Um, this can be anything from sort of like the, the, the development of democracy, greater equality between um, the genders, and also um, the influx of uh, Western media which um, uh, and things like the internet, which will help. At stage five, this is where we in the UK are, uh, the US, most of Western Europe, um, places like Japan. We are in an era of an age of what's called mass consumption. Um, the industrial base is very dominant in society. Most people, there is mass consumption of consumer goods. People um, earn enough money to be able to purchase these goods. They have disposable income to buy these things, or if they don't have disposable income, they have credit. And this leads us to what's called conspicuous consumption, which you may recall from the education module, uh, where this is, we like purchasing things. Purchasing things becomes a pastime. And we are judged by labels that we wear. And this is Rosto stage five. The ultimate goal for Rosto was for us all to be drinking Coca-Cola and wearing Nike trainers and wearing Levi's jeans and other labels. This was the stage. Uh, this was the stage that Rosto wanted um, all nations to develop to. So you might wonder, why does modernization fail? Well, we come back to our old friend, Tolcott Parsons. Um, Parsons, obviously, we, talk, we talked about in family, we talked about in education. Well, Parsons suggested that societies fail to modernize because they have not evolved. They've not moved from these traditional to modern societies. They've, they're still living by particularistic standards instead of universal ones. Uh, they still believe in ascribed status rather than achieved status. They're still, they're still collectivist rather than individualist. What Parsons suggests is that these nations should reject um, some of their traditional uh, traditional beliefs, religion. Uh, they should be embracing science. They should reject their local culture and embrace consumerism. They need to reject their kinship, uh, their family ties that are holding them back and embrace hierarchies like the class system. But this is linked back to sort of like some of the function, the key functionalist ideas that Parsons talked about, one of, one of which is what's called pattern variables um, and pattern maintenance. Um, this goes all the way back to education, our education module, and it was the school that moved you from pattern variable A to pattern variable, variable B, what Parsons called the bridge between home and society. There are other obstacles, and other sociologists have, have, have talked about the obstacles to uh, modernization. Um, obviously, the traditional values and attitudes, uh, a lack of necessary modern values and attitudes, things like the need to achieve entrepreneurialism. Some sociologists point to high birth rates and rapid population growth, which means that um, excess and uh, sorry excess 
products, uh, the surpluses that are created are actually often given out um, to the poor uh, to stop um, things like revolution. There's a lack of entrepreneurial skills within in the developing world. There is a lack of desire to compete. Um, financial institutions and banks don't provide enough capital um, to these nations. There is a lack of technology. Um, yes, there may be things like the internet, there may be roads, but they tend to be in the cities, they're not in the rural areas. And as a consequence, modernization fails. But there is a way to overcome this. And you can overcome this through what's called social engineering. And this was proposed by uh, Hoslitz, a guy called Bert Hoslitz. He said developing nations not only need to develop economically, but they also need to develop socially. They need to be able um, to have a class hierarchy where people can move through the system. They need people who are going to be geographically mobile. Lots of these developing nations have massive areas um, of rural poverty and they need people to move to the urban centres uh, where the work is. There is a process of urbanisation that is required within the developing world. And when we look at urbanisation, we'll see that some of the world's largest cities are growing in the developing world. There needs to be education and particularly Hoslet suggested Western style education for those in the developing world to teach them the necessary skills to modernize their country and the use of the media, not only through spreading the message of capitalism, but making people aware of the opportunities that modernization presented them with. Now, we come to the criticisms of Rosto, uh, which are all evaluation points. There are a lot of criticisms of Rosto um, that we can make. A lot of them come from dependency theory. First one is, is that it's historical. It explains what's happened in the West. It's based upon the Industrial Revolution uh, in Britain and in the, the US. Um, but it doesn't explain how this works. It's quite a mechanical approach as well. It, it, it says the underlying motor of change is not disclosed. So it suggests that really these are categories. It doesn't tell us how we get from one stage to the next. It just puts nations into categories. And of course, the model is based upon this American norm of high mass consumption. Is this desirable? His model also assumes the inevitable adoption of what are called neoliberal trade policies. Now, I'm going to come to neoliberalism a little bit later on. But for those of you who know about neoliberalism, this can be seen as a very negative thing, particularly uh, if you're a dependency theorist. It's difficult to apply to Asian and African countries. Their cultural, uh, their, their cultural norms and values are completely different to those in the West. The stages don't always, aren't always easily identifiable. Uh, the conditions for takeoff and pre-takeoff stage are very similar and they all often overlap. Um, according to Rosto, growth was automatic. Um, and by the time it reached the maturity stage, by the time it reaches the stage to maturity, uh, but Kuzents asserts that no growth can be automatic and the nations continue to need to push towards development. Again, we sort of like suggest that Rosto's thesis is based on Western, uh, on the Western model of modernization. Um, the, uh, but, and this is a little bit of a counter criticism, the most successful nations when Rosto was writing this were the Western nations. They were the only uh, economies that were seen as being mature. So it was very, very difficult um, to see any other alternatives. Other criticisms of Rosto's modernization theory is that a lot of nations move forwards, but then move back. Um, an example is Russia. Um, when we watched Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, we saw that Russia um, at the end of communism sort of like had a boom, but then fell back massively into, into, into huge poverty. Um, and it left the country in transition. It offers very little in the way of hope for nations that have a lack of natural resources. Places like Rwanda, um, places like Ethiopia that don't have a massive amount of resources. Modernization theory doesn't really help them. More criticisms of, of a modernization theory is that what we're doing is we're saying that Western values are superior and that the traditional values have absolutely no, uh, have absolutely no value in, in the process of modernization. But there are some countries who have kept hold of their culture 
and developed at a rapid rate. Um, Edwards looks at what we call the tiger economies of Southeast Asia, places like South Korea and Indonesia, that have mixed their religions with Western rationalism and actually become world leaders in certain fields. Going back to the idea of, of, of Western values, is the West perfect? Um, it ignores these crises of modernism, the social problems that are, are inflicted on the Western world, things like homelessness, poverty, high crime rates, drug use, suicide. Um, we haven't eradicated poverty in the developed world. You know, we looked um, several times at how one in four children in the UK um, are living uh, below the poverty line. We have 14 million people in the United Kingdom who are you know, earning less than 60% of the national average. So poverty hasn't been eradicated in the developed world. So why should we be using this model elsewhere? And also, and particularly people like Huntington talk about the resistance towards Western American, um, uh, Western and American cultural imperialism, the imposition of American values onto nations um, elsewhere in the world. And, and how does this happen? There's not too much um, in terms of contributions from sociologists and, that, that are based in the developing world through modernization theory. It's come from an American who worked for the State Department. Uh, it ignores the notion that development needs to be culture specific. It's a one size fits all approach. Uh, and so much so that Carmen suggested that it's a Trojan horse. Um, acculturation is the heart of the development business. In other words, you need to adopt an American way of living in order to succeed. Well, the criticisms, well, modernization theory sees development as a process that is initiated and implemented by outside forces, namely aid and trade, um, bringing transnational companies into the developing world um, to set up factories to help these nations. They can't help themselves. The West needs to help them or giving aid, aid for infrastructure projects through people at the World Bank. Uh, Mackay says that this emphasis of role on outside experts ignores lo local initiatives or the ability for these people to actually help themselves. Many of these nations are rich in natural resources. This is why they were colonized um, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, if they were left to do it themselves with no aid, could they actually um, be in a better position? Carmen again sort of suggests that the approach is demeaning and dehumanizing. Um, it internalizes uh, it, it, the people from the developing nations become to come to internalize this idea that they are incompetent in some way. There's been many critics of, um, for example, charity, uh, charitable causes that are raised by um, Hollywood stars. And the idea is the only people who can save people in Africa are white movie stars, which is not true. And Sankara says that if we look to the West for direction, then we become dependent upon them. <laughs> Further criticisms are that the Western um, have encouraged the elites of um, these economically underdeveloped nations. And those elites tend to have become quite corrupt and self-seeking. And there are a couple of examples, General Suharto, um, Marcos in uh, General Suharto in Indonesia, Marcos in the Philippines, who ended up milking their countries um, for uh, hundreds of millions of pounds. There are ecological limits. Modernization cannot be stretched to all areas of the planet. Uh, we need some people to consume less than everybody else. If we all consumed the American standard of around about uh, around about four to five thousand calories a day, and um, there would be not enough food for everybody and the social damage we are creating what are called false needs um, we are advertising goods to people they don't need um, we are marketing um, aggressively at young people in the developing world for things like alcohol and, uh, and cigarettes and therefore we, we are creating a lot of social damage by, by adopting modernization policies but it has been influential Right. Modernization theory was the forerunner to uh, the policies of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Um, many industrial capitalist societies are still seen as being the most successful and it has led on to the neoliberal policies in the 1980s and 90s. Now, it kind of depends on your political viewpoint as to whether you think neoliberalism uh, is successful, but ultimately modernization theory formed the basis 
of what has been the dominant economic policy of the last 40s, of the last 40 years. Again, I would suggest to you, um, you know, take that with a pinch of salt as to whether you think the last 40 years economically has been successful for most people. That kind of concludes modernization theory. Um, we next time we're going to look at dependency theory, and dependency theory is very much a Marxist theory and criticizes a lot of the ideas uh, that modernization put forward. Thanks. <laughs>